Jane is a truth teller. Yeah, the truth teller. Sometimes truth is diplomatic, I think. Oh, that's funny. Jane, your your CB8 speaks interview is great. I hope everybody watches it. David, there's a picture of you up there on my interview with um, our communications committee who just did an incredible job with that interview. Didn't you think, Will? Yeah, it was really good. I know the way they spliced in pictures of everyone. It was really, I was so impressed by all of the photos that they were putting in. Me too. I had no idea. Thank you for watching it, Will. Yeah. So, it Peter, have you seen it yet? I oh, you must. I, I haven't seen it yet. To, I will look forward to seeing it. Yes, you you get accolades. It was, it, it was in the, to blush, David. It was in the news roundup, so uh, hopefully everybody on the board gets a chance to look at it. Let's see, how many people have we got tonight? 16 so far. Okay. Or did you just mean board members? How many well, committees? Actually, many? board members, 629, so we have one minute left. Christina, there's also a picture of you, Christina, in my interview, if you look at it. She can't hear me, I guess. She can hear you, but she's yeah. muted, so she can't respond yet. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Saida, are there any members of the committee who are not, I mean, any members of the board who are not on the committee who are present? Let me see. You have one of our new members, John McClain. John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John McClain, is that? McClement. Oh, Clement. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. And it's 6.30. Great. So do your, your on, Saida. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, a few notes for you, particularly if this is your first meeting with us, you'll notice that you are muted and unable to mute yourself, unmute yourself, excuse me. Um, after the presentations, the co-chairs may call on members of the public who wish to speak. You can ask to be recognized by raising your virtual hand, and you can do that by going to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and selecting raise hand. It's important not to raise your physical hands or wave at the screen because we may not be able to see you among the participants. If you are on a phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and star six to unmute. Once you're recognized by a co-chair, I will unmute you and you may be prompted to confirm unmuting on your device. If you're using an older version of Zoom, you can access the raise hand feature by clicking the participants button on the menu at the bottom of your screen and selecting raise hand. The chat function is available for technical support only, not to ask questions of the co-chairs. You can send me a chat if you're having any issues and I can help walk you through them. Okay, back to you, Jane. Thank you. Um, welcome. I see we have a nice crowd tonight. This is the um, June meeting of the Landmarks Committee of Community Board 8. We have three applications um, to discuss tonight and formulate resolutions on. We are here for the context and appropriateness of each of the applications. We will first hear from the applicant, then from the public, and then go to members of the community board who are here to comment. So with that, we will start with our um, first application which is 1002 Madison Avenue, the Upper East Side Historic District. The application is for a new street entrance, elevator bulkhead, and restoration of the street facade. HS2 Architecture, is they're here, I'm assuming. Yes, Thomas Hutt is gonna be presenting that application and he has the ability to share his screen now. You can go ahead, Great. Tom. Thank you, Saida. We can't hear you, Tom.
maybe you should check the audio settings. If you click the little carrot next to check the little carrot next to the mute button and check your audio settings to see where your, your sound is coming from. Can't hear you. Sayada, can you help him out? Are you able to do the screen share yourself? I can do the screen share, but it's just that we can't hear him. Oh, I see. Yeah. Perhaps you could unmute him. I think he's, is he still muted or? He's unmuted. Oh, he is. Yeah. Do you need some help? If you have in a headset, you're going to leave and come back. Maybe chat me. We can't hear him. I, I know he's trying to talk, but yeah. I think he's going to chat us what he's trying to say. There's other one thing we could do is um, move on to the next. Person. Yeah, move on. What do you think, David? I don't know. Well, we only, unless we just reverse the order so that you don't have to take two in a row. But, uh, well, so that's a very good idea. Um, we could go to the third application. We're going to yeah. give Thomas a chance to um, figure out what's wrong and have our fingers crossed that it all works out for that application. So I think we're going to now go to 105 East 64th Street, the Upper East Side Historic District Workshop okay. DA. Are they present? Yes, Cass. Uh, yes, I'm on also. So uh, is that uh, Lisa? We can't hear you now. Um, hi, it's Kath Fackelberg from Higgins Quaysworth. Can you hear me? We can yes, hear you. Thank you. Okay, I just want to make sure the architects are ready because we were assuming we were going on at about seven thirty. So I'm so uh, sorry. Um, no problem. No, we're happy to we're happy to start now. If uh, I just want to make sure the team is here, um, gotcha. Lisa and Jason, are you guys on? I don't see Jason and I don't see Lisa unless they are labeled as something else. If you are, you can go ahead and raise your virtual hand. Um, yeah, I think they probably assumed they weren't getting started for a while. I see my partner, Aaron Ruley, who has the second uh, item on the agenda. Aaron, are you, you all able to start your item? Um, David, if you want to go to item number two, it's fine sure. um, with me. Unless Thomas I think in Hutt the interest of time. Sure, yeah. no, I'll go to item two, unless Thomas Hutt has figured out. It's, uh... Let's see. Tom, can we hear you? Still no. Can't hear him, can't see him. <laughs> no. Okay. Aaron, how about you? We're, we're all set. We can do it. Let's see. <laughs> okay. We're ready. Thank you. Um, I think um, Alex de Mesa is going to share from Stephen Harris Architects. Alex, do you have the presentation? <clears throat> so we're going to do number two. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 2 East 88th Street, Stephen Harris Architects, an art modern style apartment building designed by Pennington and Lewis, Inc. and constructed in 1929, 1930. Application is for alterations of floors four to 16, specifically modifying window openings, masonry repair, Recladding a portion of the 15th floor and construction of an addition at the 15th floor west terrace and pergola at the 16th floor rooftop. So, Mr. Harris and team, the table is yours. Great. Thanks so much. I'm Erin Ruley of Higgins Quays Barth and Partners. I'm joined tonight by Alex DeMesa of <clears throat> Stephen Harris Architects. And so I'll walk you through uh, a bit of the existing conditions and history. Um, and then Alex will, will take you through the design. Uh, we have here, as, as um, was introduced, uh, two East 88th Streets, an application for the, for the penthouse apartment. Um, and uh, the building is located on the southeast corner of Fifth Avenue and East 88th Street. It's directly south of the Guggenheim, which you can see in that photograph on the right. Um, and it's part of the Carnegie Hill Expanded Historic District. 
And uh, the building is a, a 13 story art modern uh, apartment house. It was uh, designed and constructed in 1929. Um, and the architects were Pennington and Lewis. Um, the, the project is at the penthouse, which is a triplex. Um, it is the top floor of the, um, the, the main section of the building. And then the two floors above, which are part of that sort of magnificent crown that's uh, differentiated above above the, the main body of the building. Um, next slide. Thanks, Alex. Um, and so here you can see it's um, those two floors of, um, of the, that crown of that setback from the uh, primary facade. Um, it's chimneys flanked by very heavy piers and they're all separated by these deep recesses uh, that you can see on both the Fifth Avenue and um, the, the 88th Street. Uh, facades. Um, and each of those piers is capped by a figural head. It's, it's a really um, extraordinary composition. Um, and all of this is boldly masked above and sitting atop the, the main body of that austere limestone building. Um, highly differentiated and just the scale of it is, is really extraordinary. Um, and you can see on the, in the photo on the right that there is a, an east wing of the penthouse that's um, a one story section that's separated from, from the tower. Um, and um, we'll, we'll take a closer look at that as we, as we run through the presentation. Um, but as, as David said, the scope of work includes um, modifying some of the existing openings. Um, there is a non-historic addition, which we can see in the photo on the left. It's a buff brick color. Thanks, Alex. Um, and uh, that, uh, was an open terrace historically. And so uh, we'll be replacing that with a new, more sympathetic design. Um, and then <clears throat> there's a small addition, which is not visible in any of these views, um, replacing an existing greenhouse and open terrace on the backside of the building. Um, and then on the, the view on the right, we can see at the 16th floor terrace, a new pergola and um, chimney and stair bulkhead. And then we're also proposing to reclad that existing east wing of the, of the penthouse. Um, and as we go through this, you'll see that um, there have been some significant changes um, over time to the building. And uh, this project's intent is to really reassert the, that highly eccentric reading of the, of the tower um, and rationalize some of the existing changes um, or the existing conditions that um, have really been diminished over time, the, the character of the, of the overall composition um, uh, with some carefully well-designed uh, modifications. And of course, this is all in the context of um, penthouses along Fifth Avenue, which have been um, highly altered over time as well. Um, next slide. Uh, here are just a couple of views, historic views of the, of the building itself. Um, on the left is the 1940s tax photograph, and on the right is a published view of the building from 1930s, from the 19, from 1930 in uh, the New York Times. Um, when the building was first constructed, there uh, was one unit per floor. Uh, the first and second floors were uh, duplexes, and the penthouse was um, from the outset a triplex, and it had 16 rooms, uh, seven Seven baths and uh, garden terraces. So that was how it was described in the original um, uh, plans for the building. Uh, when it was first publicized, it was noted that Walter Douglas um, was planning to purchase the penthouse. Douglas's mansion had been on the site. It was 1068 Fifth Avenue. Um, and he had planned to construct a replica of the Roman style gardens and fountain um, that were on the roof of his mansion. Uh, he and his wife were, were noted um, uh, horticulturalists. Um, so the original intent for the the penthouse and the terraces was very much for an active rooftop with planted terraces, um, really an extension of, of the living space. Um, on the right, you can see um, in this published view, uh, the, um, the, the original composition of that Fifth Avenue facade. So you had that asymmetry of the, of the crown, that bold center chimney, and then the open terrace to the south. Um, and of course, um, the, which has changed over time significantly. Uh, next slide. Uh, here is a view uh, while the Guggenheim is under construction, so the late 1950s, looking down Fifth Avenue, um, over to the um, uh, uh, 
to East 88th Street building that acts as a backdrop to the building. And you'll see here um, the, the east extension, the east wing of the, of the penthouse is uh, differentiated from the main um, body of the, of the tower there. Um, the, it's either very soiled or painted at that time. Um, it's uh, hard to tell, um, but it very much reads as a secondary element. And then it's also topped by um, a very tall fence. This is similar to what you see on uh, rooftop recreational spaces on schools. Um, and so perhaps it was a, a tennis court or something, but that, that um, fence is the height of the um, existing a stair bulkhead, I mean, uh, adjusted slightly for perspective, but it's a very tall fence. Um, the next slide, please. And then here we're just going to take a walk around uh, the building so we get a sense of the existing conditions. Here's the view from the park before it was fully leafed out. Um, and that uh, corner uh, addition that was added at the open terrace. And uh, it's you know, rather unsympathetic. The materials are mismatched from uh, the overall composition. And uh, there's this very tall south parapet. And, um, and at the north side, we see um, an enlarged window. This was originally two punched openings uh, separated by a, by a pier. They were then lengthened and joined. And you can see that it just cut into that string course um, that um, originally ran along the south, uh, the bottom portion of the, of the window. Um, and then on the right, um, a couple of views. This is at the, um, at the top, we're looking up at that large that enlarged window um, dropping below the sill course um, and the terracotta string course there. Um, and then down at that 15th floor terrace, so we're, we're looking at that bold chimney right in the center of the composition. All of the openings at uh, the 15th floor and the 16th floor have all been modified over time. So they've, they've changed locations and configurations. Um, these doors, I think, all date to 1994. Um, but as a result of all of that change, we have a five or six generations of brick replacement. And here you can see just maybe three or four of them um, in the context and, and none are um, particularly well matched in that, in that, um, that photo. Next slide, Alex. Great, and then here is just a view of the, the north elevation uh, showing again the, the um, uh, altered fenestration pattern, those generations of, of brick replacement uh, throughout um, at the the top right photo, we're looking up at the piers and chimney structure of the tower um, with non-historic um, uh, window infill there. And then um, at the bottom right, this is the east elevation of the 15th floor. And so uh, this entire wall has been reconstructed. These are two generations of modern brick. Um, and then these openings all date to, to recent changes at that, at that location. Uh, next slide. Yeah, great. And so now we're just up at that 16th floor terrace, looking up close and personal with the chimneys and, and the uh, figural heads. Um, there's a lot of mechanical equipment sort of scattered across that, um, that terrace that'll all be cleaned up as part of this project. Um, it, this greenhouse that's in the distance in on the left, that uh, dates to 1996. It replaced a 1980s greenhouse that was there and that's the location of our little piece of infill um, that'll fill that that little open terrace space um, in that back corner and um, in the center view we see an existing bulkhead that'll be modified Alex will talk to you a bit more about the the need to expand the stair bulkhead for the for the building and then um, uh, on the right we see another uh, photo from the 15th floor showing you that the greenhouse there and the, and the open terrace around. That's again, the site of, of the uh, proposed addition. And I think with that, I'll pass the presentation back to Alex. Okay. Good evening, I'm Alex de Mesa from Stephen Harris Architects. Um, I have some overall views here that I'll go through quickly and then um, um, I'll follow up with some more detailed views so you can see exactly what's happening on each floor. But, um, this is the Fifth Avenue elevation where you have the existing overall building on the left and the proposed on the right. Um, the top floor of the main volume of the building is the lowest floor of the apartment, as Aaron said. Um, 
with the uh, lower two floors of this uh, tower structure being the remaining two floors of the apartment. You can also see that at the top of that more modern addition on the corner, there's some existing air conditioning units that are there, which will be removed as part of this scheme and relocated to a non-visible location. The um, view on the right is the proposed view. You see here, we are proposing expanded window openings on that 15th floor terrace, um, as well as uh, the reconfiguration of the openings on the 16th floor and um, the other thing we're proposing here is to lower that uh, historic string course slightly uh, so that the window openings are not interrupting it as uh, is the case on the in the existing condition where uh, the windows have been modified in recent history. Um, you, this is the uh, north facade uh, facing the Guggenheim. Um, one of the major things that we wanted to really do here was um, create a distinction between the, vo the, the volume of the tower and that rear, that rear one story extension that's on the back of the tower, which Aaron pointed out in one image had been historically, or historically read as slightly different, whether it was soiled or painted. Um, but you can see with the proposed view on the right, we're, pro um, we're proposing expand an expanded window opening uh, on the 15th floor. Um, the existing openings uh, on the 16th floor remain in their width, but are extended down to meet the, uh, the, the slightly lowered string course below them. So that the windows on the north and uh, west facades are exactly the same height. And you'll see that in a three-dimensional representation in a few slides here. Um, that rear extension on the, fifth, on the uh, 15th floor here, um, we're also proposing some expanded window openings. All of the windows we're proposing are, are um, extruded bronze windows uh, that would be darker in color. Um, the, the rear extension um, also has a, a permanent shading device or an awning uh, that spans the length of it and then turns the corner over to the east. Uh, the idea with that was to really unify um, the length of all those expanded window openings, but we're purposely not extending it over to the tower uh, so that the reading of the tower really uh, remains as it was historically. Um, we're proposing on the upper terrace, um, a new pergola, uh, lightweight wood pergola um, with uh, a chimney volume that, uh, that holds it up and carries uh, the flues for two new fireplaces that are being uh, proposed on the interior of the apartment. Um, you can see here, um, Actually, I'm, I'm going to go into the zoom view for that one. Um, this is the east facade. Um, here, uh, this is on the left here in the existing condition. This is the uh, greenhouse. That was uh, the 1990s version of the greenhouse that currently exists. You can see here that is the location of masonry infill that we're proposing. We're then proposing a, an exterior stair that, that connects the lower terrace to the upper terrace. And we're proposing a generator screen uh, above the existing stair bulkhead uh, that will contain all of the mechanical equipment. So all of that equipment I mentioned earlier will be relocated to, to that location. So these are just the zoomed in versions of that. Again, the string course here being lowered, capturing um, all of the windows so that there's a, there's a uniformity across the length of the facade. Um, we're proposing to remove that existing parapet, which was added in the 90s, um, or was added when this corner volume was added. Um, we're proposing to replace that with a more transparent uh, bronze and glass uh, structure, which would remove the parapet and have a lightweight metal railing on, above it. Uh, the idea there was to restore the reading of the tower of the verticality of that uh, chimney element uh, as much as possible, obviously keeping in mind that this is now an interior space. So removing as much of the bulk as possible and, um, and creating a, a uniformity of uh, window pattern along the facade. Um, let's see. On the north facade, uh, on the lowest floor of the apartment, there are a couple of windows that have a transom bar. Um, we're proposing to replace those so that they're single light windows to match all of the other ones on this floor. That's about all that we're proposing on that floor. On the 15th floor terrace here, you can see these expanded window openings, again, bronze and, bronze and glass. Um, the, the cladding of that extension is proposed to be cast stone, uh, which is in the, in the tone of the base of the building. Um, you can see the pergola structure here, which aligns with the top of the existing stair bulkhead 
um, Aaron, Aaron had mentioned um, that we're expanding the volume of the uh, of that stair bulkhead. The reason for that is that this the common building stair does not come up to the top of the building. So, in an effort to uh, alleviate the um, the pressure of the I'm sorry, in order to alleviate the, the challenges that the building staff might have to come up to this floor, we're proposing to extend the building stair up uh, so that they don't have to go through the residence. Um, let's see, next slide. The east elevation here is zoomed in. Again, the greenhouse here on the left. This is where we're proposing that um, to replace the greenhouse with a masonry volume with brick to match the brick below it. New bronze and glass windows here as well. Um, you can see here the uh, east, um, uh, the, the east, uh, the, the east leg, sorry, of the awning, um, which then turns the corner to the north. Um, here is that uh, chimney volume, which carries the two fireplace flues from below, and an outdoor fireplace on the 16th floor terrace. Um, the stair bulkhead then extends upward to uh, create a screen for all of the new mechanical equipment there. And as Aaron pointed out, this, this expanded volume and stair here is um, minimally or, or even not visible from any major thoroughfare. Um, here we have the south elevation. So this is that other, the other facade of that corner volume. So that, um, that lightweight glass structure turns the corner, creates a more, um, uh, a more lightweight interpretation of what had historically been an open terrace. You can see on the left here, how that tall brick parapet extends up quite high. So our scheme is really to reduce the bulk of that. These are sort of uh, the opposite of bird's eye views, but views from below, which is how one really experiences the, um, the apartment from Fifth Avenue or the, the, the exterior of that building from Fifth Avenue. Um, the string course here reads, can, will read continuously on the north and west facades. Um, you get a view here of the uh, proposed awning, and then you'll also see that uh, really only the tops of the windows on the, uh, on, the, on the lowest, on the middle floor, that is the 15th floor, are visible. Again, more of these view, axonometric views. Um, the greenhouse here on the left now being replaced with this masonry volume the pergola, the awning, and the glass railing on the 16th floor. I should also mention we're proposing a new window opening on the lowest floor of the apartment here on the uh, east facade, which is very much in keeping with the existing openings that are there now. So we have a few photo montages here. Um, the photographs here are taken from from afar, but we've, we have, sorry, we have these zoomed in views here. Um, existing condition, this is a photo montage of the proposed condition where you can see that more lightweight glass structure on the corner. This is just an existing view of that same corner. Again, slightly Moving closer toward the front of the building as you walk around, you get a, a better view here of the, uh, the windows on the, east, on the west side. This is looking southeast from the reservoir. Uh, on the top view here, you see the, uh, the orange uh, two by fours that are framing the proposed window openings. The, um, the orange mesh you see above is the pergola structure, uh, which is slightly exaggerated for the purposes of really reading the volume, but in the photo montage, you can clearly see that the, the pergola will read uh, more transparently um, because it only has a horizontal surface. Um, here you get a much better picture of the proposed window openings on the north. As you can see, all of the expanded window openings align with the edges of the piers in the historic tower above. So there's, we're not proposing to really extend much wider than or any wider than what's there now. There's a more frontal view from the reservoir. Proposed on the bottom. The 
This is slightly further north on 89th and 5th. And then um, from 88th and Madison, so further east, um, you start to see the, um, the other side of the awning here and, the, and the, just the edge of the pergola. And that's it. Okay. Thank you very much for a thorough presentation. Uh, we would like to hear from the public if anyone has a question or comment. Saida, I'll leave it to you to see who's out there. Just to reiterate, if you're a member of the public, you can go to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and select raise hand. And if you are using an older version of Zoom, you can go to the participants menu at the bottom of your screen and selecting raise hand. I don't see any raise hand. Oh, I see one. Just one moment, if I, if I may. Uh, Erin Ruley was muted and she That's, can't unmute herself. Uh, that, was, okay. that was me, Saida. Sorry oh, about okay. that. No problem. I couldn't get back in. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay, I guess we will go to the committee. I'm so used to asking the committee to do it in reverse order. I think we should do it from the beginning order. Okay. Elizabeth? Uh, I think that this is acceptable. Um, I, I think that they're improving the windows uh, but this isn't part of the presentation, but this is yet another very good building that's had its original windows uh, replaced with totally inappropriate windows, uh, which is too bad. Um, uh, but I, I think that um, the window arrangements are an improvement. Uh, I don't particularly like the addition, which I don't think you see my thing, but um, uh, the thing that the pergola is on, um, that bit, yeah. I, I, I think because it's so high, we, I could tolerate it. I don't think it's particularly good. But uh, I, uh, I hope we can say something about, uh, you know, the destructive window replacement on the building. And uh, I will vote for this. Thank you. Gail? Thank you. Actually, I live at number two. So I live next door and I know this building fairly well. I have a couple of questions. Um, when you talk about the masonry volume replacing the greenhouse, what are we talking about in basic square feet? So I'll take you there. Let me just get there for a second. We're talking about roughly 250 square feet of this, of that, on that replacement there. Okay. It's an existing void there that will then get filled in. Mm -hmm. And um, the stair bulkhead that you're you're expanding, so it, one doesn't have to go through the residence. What are what are we talking about as far as what the uh, the square footage is of that? That's a lot less. That's more like you know about fifty square feet. Okay, I Not less. Also, I share Elizabeth's uh, feeling about the windows. I always feel sad when I walk by the, the building because the windows aren't particularly attractive, but that's not something that you have to address. Um, when one is on the roof of 4 East 88th Street or, or Planted Garden, you see the, uh, the orange mess. Now that mesh, that's for the percula? Correct. Addition? Okay. Yeah. Now, and you said that nothing was visible from major uh, thoroughfares. And I can see what you're saying about Fifth or Madison. If you are um, on the south side of East 88th itself, what about the visibility there? 
So across the street from the building where the Guggenheim is going down that block to Madison. Let me just go to that. I think we have one of those here. Yeah, the only visibility is at the corner of Mat Madison and it doesn't, it's just over, um, maybe go, it's a couple of more views in, I think. This one's slightly north. Yeah. This one, it's this one. This one, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and just to, to reiterate, mm -hmm. the, the the orange netting was is overrepresenting because it's showing the full volume of the, the outline of the pergola. So it's infilling the middle. So it's really going to be just that fine line at the top and then the chimney structure. Oh, okay. Right. And just one other question, as far as you said, bronze for the windows. I mean, what materials? The uh, bronze for the window and what materials for the remainder of the scheme you're saying? Correct. Mm -hmm. Right, so the, I'll, I'll let me just go to that elevation so I can point to it. Um, so any brickwork that happens on the volume of the tower would be brick to match the historic condition. And then this, rear, this one story extension on the back here would be clad in cast stone, uh, similar in color to the stone on the base of the building. So very much in, in keeping with that language. Um, and then the, ex the existing stair bulkhead uh, would be, which is currently brick, would be clad in a, in a zinc metal standing seam uh, cladding. Thank you. Michelle, no further questions. Yeah, thank you. A couple of questions. Um, you talked about terraces and you talked about the windows and expanding the windows, but you didn't mention any doors. So I'm wondering how does one get on to, the, to that lower terrace? I apologize, I should have been more specific. Um, the, uh, all of the window openings have uh, pairs of French doors in them. So in, for example, on, on these two larger openings, the center pair are operable uh, and those allow you access onto the terrace. So okay. there are always, in, in every large window opening, there are always a pair of French doors that lead out onto the terrace. So on this, where that, where your pointer is, on the image on the right, that mm -hmm. has a door in the center. The one to the right of it has a door in the center. And how about the one to the right of that? Is that that is that's away? also that's also a pair of doors exactly. And then and there, then, are, and there are a pair of individual leaves on the ends of this opening. Say that again. Where are the doors there? Single doors on each end. Oh, single doors on each end. Now. Yeah. Where is the spot he, on, on your elevations where the, the corner has a window on one facade and it appears as though the window wraps around to the other facade? Is that, that is, from? Yeah, so that's the Fifth yeah, that Avenue one. facade. Um, this I'm one sorry. Here. Yeah, here? but you have a corner view of it somewhere. I do. I'll, I'll go to that corner view for you. If you could, thank you. Um, one second here. Here you go. Yeah. Now that's a lot of glass. Um, is that meant? Is that a room or a closed-in terrace? Uh, it's, a is, it's, it's a, a room. room. It's a room. It's a. The idea with that was because, as Aaron pointed out, that volume had not been historic and was and it was built much later in a in a buff brick that isn't to match. Um, what we were trying to do was really reduce the the, the heft of it. Uh, to create a more lightweight structure that went back to the concept of having less bulk there. So what's the actual dimension of the windows on either side, the height and the width? I'll show you that. Uh, the windows are eight foot three and uh, 13 foot nine along Fifth Avenue. And they are uh, 14 and a half feet uh, facing south. Okay, so that's quite a bit of, uh, of window. Um, uh, Michelle, just to clarify, that was a, a terrace historically. And I think the idea here, as, as Alex mentioned, was to try to sort of represent the void to allow for that asymmetrical reading of the of the Fifth Avenue facade that it had historically. Um, I think Alex, you can jump in here, but I think this is a going to be used as an office. So it, there's not it's not going to be a, a 
a primary living space that would sort of act as a uh, as a beacon if that's the, the concern. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Now, l- let me go to the awning. The awning appears to be a permanent awning. Correct. Uh, what is it's more it of a canopy? Um, so it's not retractable. It's, it's permanent. A- Correct. And what's the depth of it and what is it made out of? It's three and a half feet deep and it's made out of the cast, same cast stone as the, as the extension below it. Oh, so it's a permanent, yeah. It is. Integral to the sort of the construction of the, the facade, um, yeah. sort of seamless. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Um, the other thing is the outdoor fireplace. Now, maybe this isn't appropriate this, but I can't think of another place and another building that has an outdoor i know you're not permitted by new york city rules to barbecue uh on a on an out on a terrace and i'm just worried wondering and concerned about an outdoor fireplace so have you screened that anywhere has that been approved at staff who are you presenting that to is this going to the commissioners so this this does yes this will go to the commissioners but this is a the all the clearances that are required by the Department of Buildings have been met and um, gas burning appliances are allowed um, in this application and the unit the, the fireplace unit in itself is a contained unit so and it's gas burning so there, it's not like a you know log burning fireplace or anything it's a self contained gas burning unit a gas starter. All right, my last question, I'm a little, still a little concerned about that, but my last question is, does the building have any kind of window plan? Erin, I think you could answer that one. Uh, there is no, there is no um, window master plan, if that's the yeah, that's what question. I mean. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's not, yeah. Unfortunately. And I think, and I think, you know, we've been, since all of most of the changes here are occurring above the main body of the building, um, the the penthouse has always sort of been distinct from what was happening below. Um, so I think you know the <clears throat> ordinarily when you propose changes to windows, the staff at Landmarks will um, uh, encourage you in the direction of a of a window master plan. But I think penthouses are somewhat separate from from that treatment because they are, uh, but in most cases distinct from what's happening below. No, I understand, but here you have a 15th floor as well and you have same yeah. pane there. And that's pretty dramatic, uh, mm-hmm. all single pane and a big and very dramatic compared to what you have above it. And also we don't know what's supposed to happen in the rest of the building below, but that's not your issue for tonight, but it is an issue overall. But anyway, mm-hmm. thank you very much. I, I appreciate the presentation, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a member of the public who is having some trouble raising his hand. Um, so, Lo, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Yes. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, great, great. Uh, my name is Lo Vanderbalk. I'm representing Carnegie Hill Neighbors. Um, I think this is a very interesting application, and uh, it's really a very oh. fine job, as many of the board members have commented. Um, I would just like to also comment. Um, I, we very much like the consistent uh, horizontal lines in terms of window lineups and uh, in terms of banding. And it makes, it makes for a much cleaner appearance. Um, I guess if we had any reservation, it might be the uh, South corner of the Fifth Avenue view. And I sent, I don't know if, uh, if Seda got my email, I sent a, a PDF um, of the view from uh, the reservoir. And, and from the reservoir, it really is quite visible, um, especially near the boathouse on the south uh, or the old pump station on the south side of the reservoir on both sides. Uh, and um, so that, that, that's something we should be aware of. There is more glazing that's gonna be apparent, especially at that top corner floor. Um, however, 
on balance, everything considered, uh, we we would approve this. This is it's a very fine job. If anything, we would have liked a, a little bit of a, of lower uh, lower uh, glass fenestration on that on that top corner floor, but it is enclosed with uh, with the um, with the upper part of, of the window, so it's not like an open uh, greenhouse effect. So um, and and these windows are uh, multi pane. So I think there's there's many positive aspects to this, uh, and uh, we could we could we could we could live with this and 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 actually commend it. Thank you. Alex, maybe you could put up the view that Lo was talking about, just so we could see that. I think we have that one. From the south. End. Something like this, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I would just point out that the view on the left is is the true eyes view without being. We're zooming into it now, but um, it's it you know it's a it's a fairly distant view um, from this perspective. Alita, thank you. I have trouble with that corner as well. I don't think that turning it into a glass box relates at all, which I know LPC doesn't really like what it doesn't relate, but it is a big glass box with a lot of windows. So I have trouble with that. I also, what will the zinc on the stair head look like? Um, that's a gray metal, right? Is it reflective? Because it's a very different look. I like zinc, but it's a very different look than the brick will be. And I'm wondering what will happen when the sun hits it. It's actually completely matte and actually acquires sort of a patina which darkens over time. So there's no, it's not reflective at all. Okay. And, and, and the commission, it's, it's a soft sort of modeled finish. It gets like yeah. a, uh, almost like a, it's a gray version of copper in essence. Like it gets that sort of powdery finish to it. Um, yeah. And the, but you but know, does not turn green. Time, it does gray. not turn green. No. Uh, yeah. Um, and, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm not crazy about the fence that's over the Fifth Avenue side. I uh, don't remember what it's for. And as for the windows, since you're changing some of them, you said some of them have transoms, and I don't see them on any of the views of the building as it exists now. I'll show you here. There are two here, just on the 14th floor. Oh, so they... And they have a the horizontal place. transom bar there. Yeah, it's not, it's not like a true transom. It's more like a an upper upper light um, yeah. in a modern window. Yeah. yeah, it's too bad that you can't change the windows because given all the attention up on the roof and to the penthouse, they really, I have to agree with my colleagues, just um, do not belong in a building like that. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have one more question. I'm sorry. In line with what Michelle was saying about the fireplace, the the two, the outdoor fireplace, the two additional indoor ones, are those gas burning or wood burning? They're all gas burning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sarah? Hi, um, thank you for this presentation. Um, I, uh, with regard to the pergola, even though it, it doesn't have a lot of mass on the design, it really does draw your eye to it. But I think that once you're viewing um, that that part of the um, of the structure from the ground that it, it it's not as um, it's not as it doesn't draw your eye as much from a distance than it um, than it might appear um, on paper. And so um, and uh, and the other comment I had is just the, the amount of glazing, the increased amount of um, glass that's on um, in the design. I, I think it, 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 in terms of the appearance, it does look more balanced. Um, but, um, you know, when even though the terrace, um, by enclosing a terrace in glass, it creates more opportunity for a light box at night. Um, and so I have that concern, um, especially since there's another building that uh, looks onto this building. Um, 
that's nearby. But um, if the Carnegie Hill neighbors um, don't see uh, a problem um, with the increased amount of glazing, then um, I can support the application. Thank you. Thank you. Marco? Uh, thank you, David. Um, in short, this is a very good The, you organize very well the crown. I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, remember, we're talking about the 50 floor and 60 floor, because the 14 is you just only replace some windows as uh, in kind. So all the work, all the changes is 15 and, and uh, 15 and 16, which basically well, my perception is you organize better the materials uh, at that height. At that distance, it's almost impossible to see. You have too much light, all this light, all the colors of the materials. And I think you did a very good analysis. And I think your approach, I think, is good. It has a good balance. On the contrary, I think you bring up the magnificent, the magnificent power, uh, the crown, that that's what you call. And I think I really like this approach. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. John? You know, I, I'm a brand new member of the board and I'm not a member of this committee. I really don't feel qualified to, uh, to offer an opinion on this. Okay. Christina? All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. No, I think it was an excellent presentation. Thank you very much. My only question was about the awning and <clears throat> that was answered. So I can fully support this. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Saida. Uh, I think I can support this application, but I do wanna echo some of, I believe it was Alita's concerns about the um, corner updated windows. Um, and I believe it was Sarah who also expressed, you know, the desire for some glazing there. Um, but of course, I will also defer to David and Jane when they give their remarks. David, Jane? Jane. Well, I will support the application. I, and the presentation was lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also will support it. I think it was, I think it's a beautifully done uh, exercise. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, the reservations about the windows in the penthouse uh, are really uh, un overstated. Uh, I think they've done a beautiful job on the windows. I think tying the windows together the way they have, they're multi-pane windows. Uh, that window at the corner uh, were a little bit uh, tinier. What difference would it make? You'd still have the light uh, coming through the windows and you have light coming through windows. This is not a beacon. This is not a 30 foot high gymnasium with all glass like I know we've uh, objected to in the past. Uh, this is residential scale uh, and it's at the top of the building. Uh, <clears throat> so it's not really gonna bother anybody. Um, but uh, I think that uh, they've done an excellent job in bringing back the uh, expression of the tower uh, with its verticality and separating out the extension. Uh, <clears throat> my only slight reservation and uh, was that uh, the pergola looked a little out of place to me, but pergolas often do. And I will uh, uh, look forward to uh, looking at this building uh, when this penthouse is done. I think it's an excellent job. I think we should support it. And uh, with that, I think uh, we need a resolution. Thank you. Somebody want to make a resolution, please? Marco? Yeah, I, would like, oh, I would like to propose a motion to approve the percentage. Is, there, is anybody can second? Seconded by Gail. 
Okay, so uh, please call the roll. Okay, uh, just give me one moment while I unmute everybody. Elizabeth? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Gail? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Alita? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Marco? Yes. John? As a member of the uh, board, you are allowed to vote. If you want to recuse yourself because you don't feel competent to do it, you can also do that. I actually think he left, so we'll keep going. Um, Christina? Yes. Okay. Kimberly? Yes. Okay. Jane? Yes. And David? Yes. Great. Okay, congratulations. Uh, I'm gonna look forward to looking at the penthouse. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we are gonna move right along to 1002 Madison Avenue, the Upper East Side Historic District. Um, I know the applicant was having a problem sharing his screen. And even well, actually being more. heard. I hope you can hear me now. We can yes, hear you. Tom. Thank you. Yay. So do you want thank to begin you. the screen share? It's an application to um, new street entrance, elevator bulkhead, and restoration of the street facade. Yes. And I believe it's an existing art gallery. Isn't it an art gallery? Um, uh, no, it's not. It will become one. Oh, it will become one. OK, thank you. Yep. Good. Can everybody see my screen now? Yeah. The images. Excellent. Apologies to the committee for that uh, technical snafu. Um, it was a, like a bad dream because I could see you, but you couldn't hear me. I couldn't hear you. But now everything's good. So thank you and good evening. My name is Tom Hutt. I'm the owner of HS2 Architecture. Uh, my client is White Cube, which is an international art gallery uh, with two galleries in London. Uh, one in Hong Kong and one in Paris. And tonight we're coming to in, before you to um, essentially discuss uh, one, one piece of the uh, project scope that we're gonna bring to uh, public hearing on the 28th, which is uh, to renovate and uh, change the entrance into, into the building. Um, there are two other smaller uh, pieces of the scope that we can touch on, but it will be reviewed at staff level. Uh, in front of you here is, uh, so one, 1002 Madison is one of the cross and cross uh, banks uh, buildings that have, have several of which are uh, in the um, Upper East Side Historic District. This one um, you're seeing on the left is a historic photo actually from uh, a book called uh, Transform the Architecture of Cross and Cross. Uh, we also have a tax photo uh, that looks very similar. And on the right is an original blueprint, a little drawing of the building uh, that we uh, found in the, with the help of the Office of the Metropolitan uh, Archive. Um, of note here, what I wanted to point out is the central window with fan light, uh, the entry uh, door, which is to the right uh, in the photos covered by an awning, and then uh, there's a window to the left. To the left, we have south, and to the right is, is north. Uh, so this establishes essentially the original look of the building. Uh, the next drawing juxtaposes the current elevation, which is on the right, with the original elevation. And um, in that, we can see that the door, well, essentially the, the central window has been removed. Uh, we'll go on to show that the fan light has been changed and demolished and rebuilt. And essentially the door that was on the north side of the facade or the right has been set made in center and they've duplicated the southern window on the ground floor with a similar double hung window to the north. Um, this drawing essentially is just is a document that we, we made just to establish that the fan light, which is very similar looking, is actually not original. 
Uh, on the left, you can see in the, in the original drawing that there is a band, a semicircular uh, mullion that it, it sits here close to the uh, origin point that doesn't exist on the current fan light. And then in the current fan light, there's a, a, a more, uh, uh, ex, uh, there's another mullion, a semicircular mullion closer to the, to the, to the edge of the, of the window that doesn't exist in the uh, original window. And, and most importantly, you can see the alignment here on the left in the drawing of the, uh, let's say the transom bar with the impost blocks left and right, they're essentially in line. And if we look a little closely here, we can see that it's very clear that the, the current transom window uh, really starts or springs below the impost blocks left to right here of the elevation. This all by, we just wanted to establish for the committee's benefit that both the door, and, both the window and the fan light had been taken out and replaced with a door and fan light that are part of the designation, uh, but were, are, neither of them are original. Um, here's essentially a current photograph. There's no canopy anymore on the building, but on the right is essentially the scope of work we propose. What's most important tonight, I think, is uh, that we propose to remove the fan light and the current columns and doors and replace them uh, with a new, uh, tra more transparent, uh, larger scale, uh, simplified window and, uh, and doors. Part of our work here for our client is to enable their art program to function. We need to give them uh, easier, uh, more flexible access into, into the space. There, this is essentially um, a smaller photographs on the left with the scope of work again denoted. I can go through it quickly. Um, I'll, I'll blow that up a little bit. There are two plaques that, that originally had the Fulton Trust Company um, uh, left and right there inscribed there. That's Mr. Fulton at the top. Uh, both those plaques have been covered up. Those, both those rectangular plaques have been covered up by HSBC with some sheet metal. That, that was the, the uh, last tenant. And we propose to do something, uh, cover those with a, not, with a removable uh, piece of uh, matching uh, material to the cast stone that can be removed, maybe with uh, three or four fastening points. Um, we're gonna remove the non-original sconces on either side of the door. We're gonna take the uh, mail slot out and replace the brick there and the granite base uh, per the original. And then um, we're going to do some, some combination of, of window scrim uh, and film just to allow us to, uh, for the program to function behind the windows. So what we propose in, in lieu of what's there is to um, create a larger uh, glass and stainless steel frame doors uh, with a simplified fan light of a single uh, glass light uh, and to have the transom bar, uh, which you see here and the top rail of the doors, both align with the impost blocks to more or less recall, I think if we, we talked about, more or less recall what the original fan light and uh, windows represented. And you can see uh, in addition, what we're proposing are 10 inch high uh, stainless steel pin mounted uh, letters describing the, the uh, new tenant's uh, name. And then in, sm in smaller five and a half inch high letters, a uh, discrete address 1002, uh, the same stainless steel pin mounted letter. A little bit more detail here, uh, a kind of a view of the poles we're proposing are simple rectangular uh, profile poles that will go from bottom rail to top rail. Um, uh, there is going to be, uh, and it may be actually easiest for us to see this in, the, in this render, there's going to be a white metal liner very similar to the current wood uh, jam that's in there and a smaller stainless steel frame that holds the doors and and the top fan light above it uh, the the uh, uh, flag and flat pole will remain and um, just go back here and essentially 
the building itself will uh, undergo a, a fairly gentle cleaning. We're going to, there's some serious remediation issues that uh, due to leaking that we can see in this, in this view, you can see how bad there's been a leak that's been un, untreated for a long time. So we're gonna remediate that. We're gonna clean up the building. We're gonna repoint the brick as needed. We're gonna get rid of uh, this sort of uh, unsightly mail slot to the right. Um, and then what we're going to go with on the 28th uh, to the public hearing of the commissioners is to present this replacement of the non-historical um, doors and fan light with a simplified fan light and, and, and doors. So that is your presentation? Uh, I'm just going to show a few more things. Okay, that they're, they're, yeah, that um, we brought just a few precedent images. One is a older C of A uh, for 822 Madison Avenue, which in which the commission noted that uh, as a premier shopping street, Madison Avenue is characterized and should reflect contemporary design and storefronts. Um, the C of A also, and transparency, C of A also talks in this particular instance uh, of the contrast between a sort of modern and more transparent uh, glazed bottoms and the contrast with uh, some of the masonry, upper masonry facades. And so in, in the application here, we are also showing different examples of, of larger glazed areas in the more traditional buildings with the, the, the masonry above. I just finish here quickly with two other items that we will be bringing to landmarks. And one is the, the uh, uh, we're going to replace the current stair at the back of the building with an elevator bulkhead. And this diagram for landmarks will just show the minimum amount of overture over uh, that we are going with the, with the bulkhead is actually lower than the stair bulkhead. Uh, it's slightly wider in plan. Um, there's a few pictures that show that it's pretty landlocked up here, the view. And, um, and then just one last view showing a sort of a backlit uh, scrim and, and film on our windows that we propose. So uh, yes, that is the extent of my presentation. I have questions of anybody and or uh, be glad to entertain any questions. Well, thank you so much and thank you for your presentation. Is there anyone from the public who wants to address this? Saida, do we see any raised hands? I don't see any raised hands. Just a reminder, you can go to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and select raise hand. And if you're using an older version of Zoom, um, you can go to the participants menu and select raise hand. If you're on the phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. Thank you, Saida. If there's no one from the public and you don't see a raised hand, I think we could go to the committee. We can do the reverse order this time. Great. Marco? Thank you, Jane. Um, let me see, your argument is uh, because the way that was built was not built according with the original drawings. Therefore, you are proposing to change dramatically the main decoration, which is the main, the central window of this facade for something extremely simple and trendy right now on uh, Madison Avenue. I think that's pre pretty much what you are saying. I mean, and uh, I'm, I'm a serious, I have serious concern with that, even that you change the materials, the traditional materials, which is good to uh, metal materials. Uh, I, I, honestly, um, I have serious reservation, even in the size of the lettering that you are proposing. Uh, you try to fix on uh, uh, construction issues. That is perfectly fine. You want to improve the rear part. That is perfectly fine. But I have serious problems to, uh, to understand your logic. And thank you so much. This is my, okay. uh, my comments. Thank you. Sarah? Hi, um, I understand that the uh, fan light and the door are not original, uh, but it seems like the new design is such a departure from 
uh, what we know um, at that building. Um, but there are also other commercial buildings that have had their doors and windows replaced in a way that is uh, that facilitates commerce better. And so I, I guess I don't know um, how I, whether or not I could support this application and I look forward to hearing from my colleagues. Thank you. Alita? Hi, my first comment is I really disagree with your covering up Fulton because that's part of the historic context and something that would seem to be really valuable. So I do not like at all that it won't be visible. I think whatever remnants of New York's history we have, we should maintain. Um, second of all, I have to agree with what sounds like the comments of my colleagues that I, I, I don't know how to express it, but I don't care for the door and the transom. I think the size of it is, at least from your renderings, is, is quite large and needs to be somewhat more in context with the history. I gather why Cube is contemporary art, but that doesn't mean that it necessarily has to be such a departure from what we already have. Um, so basically, I don't think I could approve it the way it is right now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alita. Michelle? Yeah, um, I'm very, very disturbed about the door. So I won't support the application just based on that. But I do have a couple of questions in addition. Did I hear you say that you're putting a film over the windows? As I look at this rendering, there's like a cloudiness to it, but I don't know. And you said a film, I don't know if you were referring to the back of the building or if there is an well, we're gonna work. We're gonna work with uh, staff to either put a, a scrim set back from the windows. Uh, that's what we have in mind to have a, a natural scrim there so that there can be, um, you know, we have, we have exhibition upstairs on the second floor where we'll have some walls behind and in front of those windows possibly. And uh, so we'll work with landmarks to resolve that. So some interior fabric yes. or artificial wall that will block the street viewer from looking into the space. Is that your point? That's correct. And then also we have a stair that we have to accommodate uh, for DOB, which is right at the front of the building. And that's within one window there. And we will uh, put a scrim in front so the stair is not expressed. The landings are not expressed on the exterior. OK, so when when there's a scrim in that place, which will be permanent, it appears, and there well, are no scrims or you pull away, you pull the scrims away from the other two windows, one will appear cloudy or you can't, not transparent and the others will be transparent? I think we would probably choose to put scrims at each of the windows there so they keep them consistent. Okay, it's an un unusual for retail to block uh, visibility to the interior, but of course that's a business decision. Uh, you didn't mention lighting. Um, are you planning any lighting? If we can go back to the front facade, uh, are you planning any lighting for the front of the building? We are not. And no, no subtle lighting behind the sign white cube? Uh, no, it's just going to be pin mounted letters. Okay. Um, and you're going to have this scrim behind the upper windows as, as well? We are. Okay. Well, the thing I do like about it, and I hope this is the case that you're keeping the flag, <laughs> the flag, <laughs> the flagpole, is that going to stay there as you've represented? We are. Okay. Well, I'm happy about that, but I can't say I'm very happy about everything else. So unfortunately, I can't support this. I'm sorry. I'd like to see a more traditional look. And I think it's very possible with your front doors. This is a very, very out of keeping not only with the building, but with the surroundings. I think you can do better than that. I'm sure you can. Thank you. Thank you. 
I certainly recognize that Madison Avenue is a commercial <laughs> street that you want to be able to uh, certainly move forward and do something that is a little bit unique. However, when I look at the door and with the steel and the way in which it's configured, it just looks out of place. Even with the windows, with the shrooms behind them and all, you can see that that can work. But you did make uh, mention of the fact that your clients were concerned um, as far as their interior space. And can you explain how this particular door? I think I, I, what I meant to say is that the scale of the door, the width of the doors is very important to their art program in terms of bringing art in and out of the building. And so we've uh, tried to work with the design in such a way to allow them the maximum access for their art, which is obviously essential to their, to their functioning. The current doors now are, are, are very small and uh, would not be really feasible. There's, there's no loading from the back. In other words, no. all of the no. art has to go through the front door. Goes through oh. the front door, correct. And and what was the the reason uh, for using metal and stainless steel? Just from a design vantage point, or was there any other reason why you chose? No, those I, I think I think our feeling was that a contemporary looking door in this historic masonry building was appropriate, and uh, we have felt that there was many examples of of, of projects either that received CFAs down down the block and. Uh, um, Landmarks has actually been fairly positive and receptive to this approach. So it, it was essentially that, uh, and I, I just want to correct one thing. I didn't mean by, by discussing the history of the fan light to say that that is the reason uh, we, we took everything out. I just wanted to establish that as not an original component. That's all I, I was meant by that, just so that I understand that the way it looks now is a designation, has been designated. Uh, this has all been designated. I just wanted to indicate that the fan light wasn't original. Um, that's all. So well, yeah, I so I think our feeling was that this was actually an appropriate <laughs> uh, intervention in this. There's a, a ratio of masonry to glass is quite large. And uh, we felt that this scale here is con you know, consistent with different scales on Madison Avenue, uh, different glazed uh, changes and uh, we, we thought it was an appropriate uh, intervention and change. Well, when I look at Marnie and some of the others, they just seem to be better integrated with the changes. This, and I understand the width of the door. Maybe it's just the materials, but my personal view is it doesn't look particularly appropriate. But thank you so much. Elizabeth? Yes. Uh, I think absolutely everything is wrong with this door. I can't think of anything to say good about it. Uh, th the fact that you think that, that similar things happen on Madison Avenue, for all I know, there's a door like this in Peoria, but I don't care. This goes with this particular building. Uh, a building, this building has, and buildings like it have, everything is textured on the approach. It's too big for this thing. It looks completely out of place. It, uh, it looks like you, you ran out of money having done the other windows nicely and uh, sent somebody down to Home Depot and said, please buy me some doors that I can afford. I think it's a disaster. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but it, it's totally inappropriate for this building, and that's our standard, not what's inappro uh, appropriate somewhere else on Madison Avenue. Uh, and uh, the, the door may, may insists that I will vote against this proposal. Kimberly? Thank you, Saida. Um, I won't belabor the point. Um, I am inclined to disapprove um, this presentation purely based on a lot of the reasons that Elizabeth just enumerated. So thank you. Thank you. 
Christina? Yeah. Well, I, I want to talk about context because <clears throat> this is a major, major international British a gallery coming to New York that will bring international collectors, tourists, commerce to a badly needed Madison Avenue. They sell massive sized modern art. They don't have a freight door. They don't have a side door. They don't have a back door. This is how they're gonna get the art in and out of the building. So we have to think of context. And so I am in support of this application. I have one question. How large are the white cube? Um, 10 inches that, high. Pardon me? 10 inches high. 10 inches high. It's not even a foot. Less than a foot. They're yeah. tiny. So I think we have to look at this, step back and take a look of what Madison is, what we need, who they are, what they'll bring to the city, and how they have adapted this space to uh, the needs of the gallery. And we've done that many, many, many times on Madison Avenue. Many. Been on this committee for years and years. Thank you. So um, I would support this. Is that the um, committee and the public members? Correct, with the exception of David. Okay. Well, maybe I'll speak before David. Not one person has mentioned Cross and Cross, two of, uh, one of the most preeminent architectural firms in, on the East Coast, New York City, the Gold Coast. I believe they designed the Tiffany Building on 57th Street and Fifth Avenue. I myself, I beg to disagree with you, Christina. We are here for context and appropriateness, and I cannot support this application as presented. So now we can go to David. Well, I hate to disagree with my co-chair. It's very rare that that happens, but uh, Christina actually anticipated me uh, about context. But I, but, but I do have some questions because when I look at the rendering, I'm assuming that those doors are absolutely transparent, that they're clear glass, is that correct? Correct. So that the whole idea, I think, is that as you pass the building, you can see into it and you can see that it's a major art gallery? Yes, you'll see into the main gallery and the ground floor. Also, that the windows uh, with the scrims behind them, you're seeing through transparent glass to whatever attractive design you put on those wind on the on the scrims is that correct correct okay um, i think that uh, what you have here is uh it's, it's a very handsome small but solid uh, uh building and <clears throat> essentially uh for the most part everything is very sympathetic if you're going to talk about uh, a historically uh, correct or appropriate uh, interpretation of what this building should be today as opposed to what it was when uh, it was built because not anything here seems to be what was built except for the masonry itself. Uh, I do think that uh, the central opening in some way echoes the original central window, uh, but more to the point, I think that this building uh, has enough strength to accept the juxtaposition of the modern entrance with the traditional design. <clears throat> and given context, given Madison Avenue, given the tenant, given that over the long term, this is reversible if it ever comes to that, uh, I think that this is uh, appropriate for the tenant, appropriate for Madison Avenue. Uh, and uh, that the building has the strength to accept an event or an intervention uh, that is in fact modern uh, and transparent against uh, what is a relatively solid masonry building. So that's where I'm coming out. It certainly has my vote. Thank you, David. I think we're, um, 
We're ready for a resolution. Does someone want to propose a resolution? Michelle? Um, I do see a member of the public oh. with a raised hand now. Um, Sarah? Uh, hi. I'm not sure at what point the public can speak, and I've listened to everybody, so it's probably out of place, but uh, as a public member, I do walk down Madison Avenue. Um, I And I get the reference to the Marnie, but it's a different architecture. And this is a federal architecture. And I think, and I, I get, I get David's point, but there has got to be a way to incorporate a more federal look to that door than what's presently shown. And I completely respect that you have to get artwork through there, completely respect that. But there are elements that are missing for me in terms of a very important building because I happen to love this building. So, so I am going to call that out. And uh, yes, whether it's my place or not, I'm, I'm going to make those call outs. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Normally, people from the public speak after the applicant presents, but thank you for your comments. Did anybody want, I think, Michelle, did I call on you for a resolution? Thank you. Yeah, I've listened to everybody. Um, anyway, I won't go on. I'd like to make a motion to disapprove for all of the reasons that were stated. I think that the doors can be redesigned so that they're more sympathetic to the past and to the existing building. I don't think that, that, that that's an impossibility. And if you thought it was an impossibility and you're choosing a building to which you have no access, then perhaps it was the wrong choice. But um, it just seems to me that- We just need a resolution, Michelle. And just I was speaking to it. I was speaking to it, which I think I'm allowed to do. Anyway, that's my resolution to disapprove. Thank I second it by Marco, Jane. Thank you, Marco. Um, thank you, Saida. I think we can call the roll now. Okay. You have to call the question first. Oh, call the question. Well, it's hard on Zoom to remember all these things. All in favor. <laughs> I think everyone's in favor of calling the question, Michelle. So Saida, you can call the roll. Okay. Just give me one moment while I unmute everyone again. Elizabeth? Yeah, uh, yes to a no. Gail? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Alita? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Marco? Yes. Christina? No. Kimberly? Yes. David? No. Jane? Yes. I'll have the tally in one moment. Thank you so much, Saida. Um, I guess I'm going again um, tonight. We're now going to go to 105 East 64th Street, the Upper East Side Historic District. Workshop DA, and I think is Quiggins and Hig can't why I'm having a senior moment. Higgins and Quaysbarth also part of the presentation. Yes, yes, we are. Okay, so I think we're ready to go. This is an application to alter and enlarge the building, really to put on a uh, sixth floor at the top with a mansard roof and replacing the facades. Terrific, thank you. Uh, Jason, let's go to the next slide. Um, shall I begin? Yes, please do, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you, yes. Hi, I'm Cass Stackelberg from Higgins Grace Barthman Partners. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Link Lindsay Peterson, uh, and joined by Jason Allen and Lisa Chow from Workshop Design and Architecture. Um, the project site is 105 East 64th Street, um, located in the Upper East Side Historic District, um, highlighted uh, in yellow on the uh, Sanborn map <clears throat> and uh, with a red dot on the district map. Um, before I, I jump into the presentation, I do want to just sort of talk a little bit about um, process. 
Um, the building that you can see obviously in the photograph on the left uh, is uh, a brownstone coated, um, a uh, brownstone coated uh, row house that uh, was constructed in 1882 and then altered in the 1940s. Um, in the Upper East Side Historic District designation report, uh, this building along with the one directly to the east are called out as a no style building. And I'm, I'm gonna sort of continue a conversation that we had back in March where we presented a similar project uh, to the committee. Uh, it was a Robert Stern designed row house. Um, and since that presentation, we went to the public hearing at Landmarks and there were some cl clarifications that um, particularly the general counsel at Landmarks made to the commissioners that I thought might be relevant to sort of reintroduce here in the context of these no style buildings. Um, in particular, as it relates to the way the building uh, has been calendared at Landmarks. Um, Jane, as you mentioned, the, the original calendaring that Landmarks provided was for uh, enlarging the building. They've recently changed that to just calling it constructing a new building on the site. And so um, I wanna just be sure that the committee understands that is how it's being calendared at Landmarks. Um, it's basically a new building on the site. Uh, party walls and foundation walls are being retained, but this is basically a new building. Um, and the general counsel at Landmarks, Mark Silverman clarified for the commissioners that in evaluating, and this is for the commissioners, you can, obviously you all will choose to look at this the way you'd like, but in evaluating the application, the commissioners um, as directed by general counsel <clears throat> really are not considering the demolition of what's there on the site. They're only considering the design of the new building. Um, and that's particular to no style buildings on the Upper East Side. It goes back to the designation of the district in 1981 and the Board of Estimate findings as part of that designation. So I thought I'd provide a little bit of that context, which um, may or may not be useful to you, but I thought it might be useful. Um, it's how the commissioners are going to be evaluating this and we're calendared for a public hearing uh, on June 28th. Uh, later I'm just going to interrupt you for one second because I yes. just want to clarify that myself. The building is not being totally demolished because the foundation is going to be retained and um, I think some of the side wall, the party walls, but the commission is just going to look at the front elevation, the rear elevation and the rooftop addition when making their um, decision. Correct. So they're okay. not evaluating de demolition, they're evaluating the design of the and front we of the wouldn't side. either. We would look just at the design. So thank you. Okay, terrific. Very good. It's sort of a continuing conversation since March and I thought I'd share that, but uh, let us jump in um, and discuss the project. Um, this is the existing condition. Uh, next, please. Um, and a little bit of context um, for, for you all just to see the block context. Um, Jason, if you can highlight 105 East 64th Street, the building uh, was constructed uh, as a row of six houses. That included uh, the first building fronting onto Park Avenue, which was 103, and that was uh, reconstructed in 1920 and then extends down into the block. Um, directly to the north is the, uh, is the 1954 uh, apartment building 605 uh, Park Avenue. Uh, and then block context also includes the 1920s apartment building uh, on the northwest corner of Lexington and 64th Street with row houses, sort of an eclectic mix of row houses along this north side uh, of the block. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a photograph of uh, the five houses beginning on the right um, is the limestone fronted house. This is a building uh, that was reconstructed under commission approval in uh, 2011. Uh, it too was a no style building, was uh, approved for reconstruction um, with a ashlar limestone, rusticated base, et cetera. And then the next uh, four buildings, uh, maybe you can just highlight those, Jason, with the cursor, are continue to be no style, sort of stucco brick clad facades. 105, you can see sort of tucked behind the tree. And then 103 in Neo Federal Building on Park Avenue. 103 is 64th Street on the far left or uh, west end of the, of the row. Next slide. The proposal uh, is to really reconstruct the site with a new limestone fronted uh, uh, facade as a rusticated base. 
uh, a multi-light uh, parlor level window and then a sort of gradated uh, third and fourth floor and a slightly smaller uh, fifth floor and then a sixth floor uh, that's uh, articulated with a sloped mansard finished in zinc with um, limestone coping and a brick, uh, brick sidewall. Um, it is a building that draws from uh, historic references seen in the district, but it is a little bit more of a sort of a contemporary expression in some of its detailing. And Jason will, uh, will take you through that. Uh, next slide. Um, just some quick photographs of the existing building. The upper floors have been all coated in stucco. The stucco itself is not in great shape, but really there are no architectural features that are uh, that are significant. Uh, on the left is a photo of the base of the building. Uh, there's a small areaway with two entries at the ground floor. Uh, as you'll see, we're reconstructing within the areaway. There's no extension out onto the sidewalk. Next slide. Um, so photographs on the roof, um, sort of unremarkable skylights, bulkheads, things like that. Just one thing to point out, there's a very tall uh, iron uh, fence um, that you can see from the street. And Jason, maybe you can point that out uh, in the photographs that runs along the uh, west parapet and separates uh, the roof of 105 from the gabled roof of uh, 103 East 64th Street. Next slide. Um, some historic images, these are from the 1920s. On the left, the photo from 1927 that illustrates the reconstruction of 103 East 64th Street into this uh, really distinguished neo-federal house. Um, the building on the corner historically was built with the rest of the row and had the same detailing. But um, as you well know, throughout the district, um, within the first, typically within the first quarter of the 20th century, many of the buildings that were built as sort of speculative row houses as part of large rows were changed hands and then were reconstructed by new owners in a variety of styles. And uh, 103 is one of, you know, one of those examples. And you can see the row uh, more or less intact and the adjacent row beyond uh, in the 1920s remaining. Next slide. Um, the 1940s tax photo shows uh, 105 at the center. Uh, 107 has already been stripped, uh, and you can see that on the right side of the, the photo on the left. Uh, the photo on the right uh, from the 1960s illustrates uh, the condition as it is more or less today of 105, which really was altered in, the, in, in 1941. There was a rear extension that was demolished. We take the stoop, and the front facade was stripped at the same time. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we've done is we sort of looked at the way these new buildings sort of found their way into the context of these very uniform rows of row houses. And it, what's interesting is there are a series of articles uh, written in the architectural journals within the first couple decades of the 20th century that sort of document and, and acknowledge um, this, this, this change that, that is occurring from the uniformity of these speculative row houses to the individuality of these sort of purpose-built, redesigned row houses. And just to sort of read this quote, the pioneer in a block in a block front ought to be allowed the privilege of dictating his material to the neighbors of his previous row. Um, it cannot be expected that his successors will or indeed can always follow his lines and levels. And what's interesting is that there's this understanding that as the houses are changing and their individual owners who are redesigning, as you can see in this collection of photographs here, there's a, a fascinating mix of styles and articulations that really make the Upper East Side Historic District the sort of rich tapestry that it is. Um, I think we see that in, in, in the row of six houses on 64th Street with the neo-federal house from the 1920s and subsequently the commission approved house at 113. And so there's this evolution both historically but also under commission approval for this sort of change and, and re or, or introduction of new styles within rows. Next slide. Um, this next, next slide also illustrates some of those. This is an article from uh, 1903, also in the architectural record, that just says the conditions conspire to bring about the most extraordinary contrast of design and material. Each house has the distinction of an individual design. So we wanted to sort of recognize how the journals from the first quarter of the century um, really chronicled uh, the, the introduction of new styles, new materials sort of within this row of the uniform brownstone fronted houses that were largely built in the 1870s and 1880s. But by the turn of the century, 1900, really began to change uh, and really make up the composition of the district today. Next slide. Um, within the block, as I mentioned, on the far left, 103 64th Street, also known as 601 Park, 
this sort of introduction, this individuality, and then uh, on the right, the two images, the building at 113 as it appeared at designation with a strip facade and then the limestone fronted facade that the commissioners approved uh, in 2011. Next slide. Um, some examples of commission approved limestone fronted buildings. Um, there's a wide range. Um, they range in articulation. Some are very classically inspired. Others like these, particularly the one in the, in the middle, um, has sort of more of a contemporary expression. And as Jason will describe, that's sort of how he is approaching the design. They're classically inspired details for sure, but the expression is in a perhaps more contemporary fashion. Next slide. Jason. Is Jason on where he was here a second ago? Jason, can you unmute or Saida, can you unmute Jason Allen? Jason, you might have to confirm unmuting. I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hello? We can hear you. Let's just back up. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can yeah. hear you. Oh, thank you so much. All right. Good evening, CB8. Um, I'm Jason Allen with Workshop Design. Um, we approach this, uh, as, as Cass alluded to, uh, as a, um, an ornamentation of the front facade. We, we strip, um, <clears throat> if you notice on the left-hand side, the, the original facade was stripped of ornament and detail. Um, it's basically been stuccoed over. Um, there's aluminum windows. Um, the entry itself uh, is dropped down two feet from grade, and there's not much of the original um, facade left. Uh, so our approach, is, as Cass mentioned, was to um, take and apply a new facade uh, to, to the front of the building here. It's basically broken up into a, you know, a, a tripartite uh, scheme here. Uh, we have a, starting at the base, we have a heavy, heavily rusticated base with a centered entry, and this is uh, raised up to grade. So instead of going down the two feet from, from grade, um, as it was in the existing, we've, we've brought everything up. Um, we prefer this approach. Uh, above this, we have the shaft area, which is uh, an ashlar uh, limestone, fully bedded, um, honed. And this is gonna continue from the second floor up to the fifth. Um, on the second floor, we, you know, we start our, our window groupings. Um, these are gonna be a, a steel uh, window. Um, all the windows in the front that are operable are all casements, um, steel casements with the true divided lights. Um, we've also brought some of the ironwork uh, decorative ironwork that we have at the at the base, we brought it up into these small railings um, that accent these punch windows on the uh, third, fourth, and fifth floors. Um, the fifth floor is um, traditionally uh, compressed a bit, so this this floor is a little bit shorter in the window expression, but we've added some extra detailing in between the windows with some um, panels. Um, above that, um, we have a sheet metal cornice um, and this really is quite simple it's it's got corbels and dentals and then um, we really tried to get uh, this starting at the same point as the existing cornice uh, in our neighbor at 107 um, above the cornice itself um, we're utilizing a mansard which is setting back um, from the, the front face of the building with these three uh, dormers punctuating it. Um, the material itself is, uh, we thought zinc would be a, a nice light um, color complement um, and not too contrasty with the base. It, it's a soft material. It looks good against the sky and we thought that would be a, a nice way to, to clad this upper story and not uh, create too much contrast. Um, to the sides of the zinc, um, we have a caps on the two party wall and terminations, uh, those are limestone caps. And then as this wraps around on either side, it's gonna be a, a brick um, on the uh, lot line walls that spring above the existing roof lines. Um, 
we'll get into some more detail at the entry um, a little bit later. But really, I think what we wanted to do here was just just organize uh, this facade um, in, in a very proportional and simple way. But th there are some referential or familiar elements um, and materials and motifs uh, woven throughout it. So um, the inspiration was taken from a lot of the source material that Cass had presented earlier on. Um, and we've worked through this uh, quite extensively in, in terms of developing the massing and the uh, design of the facade here. So I will go to the next slide. So I think you could get a better understanding of the three uh, parts of this composition, you know, the base, the heavy rustication, the newly centered entryway, the double doors, a wider opening um, that's, you know, on grade. Uh, you've got the, some framements and um, you've got a grouping of windows at the parlor level, um, which is a larger grouping to sort of break up the repetitiveness of, of this uh, punched uh, window expression that continues from floors three through five. Um, as I mentioned, the windows are all in swing steel casements, uh, truly divided lights, um, and we have uh, metal, um, uh, or, or iron work at the, um, at the frames of each window here. Um, around the windows themselves, you can see limestone and framements and a uh, profiled sill. We've also introduced some like secondary horizontal striking and coursing across to sort of break this up a little bit, add some shadow and interest uh, to the facade. So it's, it's not so planar as, uh, as it was previously. Um, and then again, with the sheet metal cornice that um, caps off the limestone base. This um, <clears throat> has some simple corbels and dentals. And then really from that point on is, is where the mansard starts. Again, with these three dormers that are a sort of a softer geometry with the rounded tops, we thought that was a, a little bit um, more um, soft uh, expression at, at, this, uh, at this upper story here. Um, and you can see the masonry uh, party walls that extend beyond the, uh, the base there. Those continue at both lot lines um, and those are both capped with the uh, limestone caps. <clears throat> so the rendering, which you saw previously, basically gives you a, a, an idea of the, the materiality and, and the palette here and also how it kind of sits in context with its neighbors. <clears throat> you can see uh, the reference to the height of, of our addition um, altogether, that one story um, above, almost similar to this, this iron fence that was on the, the existing uh, structure. Uh, so we've got the uh, mansard with the uh, zinc, and then we've got the five-story limestone base and then we've got um, sort of these classical elements and motifs uh, throughout. Yeah, okay. So I think this is um, a good place to start in terms of what changed um, in the section of the building, how exactly um, this works. Uh, we have the existing Cellar it was pretty common. It's a seven foot four uh, uh, shallow cellar. Um, you can see the step of two feet from grade to the basement level. And then above that to this, this parapet here, the, the building rises about 60 feet um, from grade to parapet. Uh, the roof pitches back and there's a 33 foot five and three quarter inch um, existing rear yard. So the, the next slide will give you an indication um, let's start again at grade. Um, I'm sorry, how long, how big is the rear yard? You said 35 feet or 30 feet? Uh, 33 feet, five and three quarter inches. Okay, thank you, sorry. Yeah. So uh, required legal yard is 30 feet, so that leaves us three, uh, three foot, uh, five and three quarter inches. Um, <clears throat> starting from entry, as I mentioned previously, we, we brought the building up two grades, so it's no longer down two feet. Um, this limited the excavation. Um, so really, we are trying to increase from that seven foot four in the cellar um, to a, a 10 feet 
down there. So it just required us to do 14 inches of excavation um, at, at the cellar. But bringing the, the ground floor up actually, you know, added some extra space in, in that and also improved the entry sequence. Um, you can see the outline of the existing building overlaid on top of, of the new building. Um, with regards to the rear yard, 30 foot rear yard now, the three foot five and three quarters is the first uh, through fourth story projection into the rear yard. Um, at the fifth story, we align with our neighboring building, uh, 107 to the east. Um, above that is the uh, new rooftop addition. Uh, One sec, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you're actually, there's an addition at the rear from the ground level through the fourth floor that makes the, the rear yard a little smaller. You're reducing it to 30 feet. The, the if you're if you're referring to at grade in the rear, this is the uh, portion of the cellar. Uh, so there's steps down to grade there, but for legal light and air and from for Department of Buildings purposes, from the back facade to the rear lot line is 30 feet from okay, the because first because you added a little bit of um, hmm. space, square feet to the interior, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's uh, all I wanted yeah, to clarify. Yeah. No okay. problem, absolutely. I, I think the existing building, from a zoning perspective, is 6,270 square feet. Um, the proposed building is uh, 7,490 uh, square feet, zoning square feet. Okay, okay. so yeah. it's, it's roughly uh, you know a, a, a 1,200 square feet um, uh, from a zoning perspective. Um, okay. So um, getting back, back to that that fifth floor, which aligned with our our neighboring. Um, building you'll see that better in the in the rear renderings when we get there um, above that is our rooftop addition this is set back um, 14 feet uh, five inches from the rear um, to the face of, the, of this addition um, we did this so we can put the mechanicals on that level and so they wouldn't be visible from the street above uh, the if we had to place them on top of the upper rooftop um, so most of the mechanicals are back there. We're going to ex extend the chimneys uh, on the neighboring buildings um, that are adjacent to us, a, a total of three feet um, as required. Um, but this is, oh, and you can see the mansard and the, the dormer at the front here with, with our you know, new proposed cornice coming pretty close to the existing parapet height that was there before. Um, I should mention that we tried to compress this story as much as possible. It's eight foot 10 clear on the inside. Um, and, and we did this to sort of minimize the, the bulk of the, the mansard of, above the existing um, and also you know, provide enough space inside that we can coordinate um, all, all of our building systems. Um, so. How high is the mansard by itself? I, you gave me the interior, it's eight feet. 10 inches high on the inside. How much on yeah, the outside? Clear. The mansard itself is um, 10 foot floor to floor. And then there is uh, a roofing system and a parapet system, which is another four feet and change. Mm. Okay. So the whole depth of, of this addition here is it, you know, from the, let's say from the, the face of building to the back is, is about 45, nine. Then there's a 14 foot five setback. Then there's a three foot five and three quarter setback. And then there's this, this terrace at the back here, which is um, eight foot six that goes into the yard. <clears throat> so we'll go to the next slide. Um, the front of the building, um, you can see in these images, this is that uh, recessed area way that sets down two feet from sidewalk level. The property line is actually at the, the front of this planter. Um, and we're not gonna do any work beyond the property line in, in that respect. Everything that we will do will be inside of uh, this, this area uh, leading in uh, to the new entry level. So all the work out front. I do have a, a blow up, which I'll get to in a second to give you a better illustration of the, of the entry sequence. Um, so on, on the left, you can see 
the existing conditions, you go down uh, four uh, steps into this, this two foot recessed area. Um, there's actually two sets of steps and then there's a fence and, and a raised curb. And then there is a small door uh, for main entry off to the side and a secondary uh, entry into the pantry. Uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to centralize the entry and bring the, bring the entry sequence up to grade. Um, this just proves access and um, it creates a, a grander scale entry. So we were able to do a nice enframement around the um, entry double doors uh, with a nice lintel over top and some corbels. Uh, we've got this heavily rusticated uh, limestone and then about uh, 30 inches um, above uh, the entry uh, at the base here, we have a uh, granite water table. Um, the openings are going to be glazed with a decorative uh, ironwork um, on each one of these. And um, the landing itself um, out in front is gonna be paved with granite to match that water table. So there's a slight step up from grade, it's four inches up and in. Um, that's just a small transition, but uh, the idea was again, to raise the building up and to, to, to restructure it so we wouldn't have to excavate to, to, to really create this, this uh, on-grade entry. Um, <clears throat> Cass. So, um, so for context, we, we've included just a handful of historic examples. Um, there, we could have chosen many, but obviously, five-story limestone-clad row houses with uh, an additional mansard floor uh, are are uh, typical in the district. These are just a handful of examples here: uh, 65th Street, 68th, and 62nd Street. A range of different articulations for the facades, but you see typically a rusticated base sort of more of an ashlar planar um, facade and the sort of gradation and graduation of, of the uh, window openings with smaller openings at the top. And then a range of different um, scales and heights of mansards above that. The ones mm -hmm. obviously at the center, the two on 68th Street are, are very tall. Uh, ours are proportionally not as tall, but uh, you can see the sort of a range of, of uh, detailing and scales. Next slide. Um, there are also numerous examples of this articulation at the parlor level that we're proposing, which is the sort of ganged windows with the heavy mullions. Um, this is also a treatment that one sees uh, throughout the district examples in the 60s and the 70s. Um, so again, the idea is to sort of draw from the historic references in the district, but to do it in a slightly contemporary expression through the use of steel windows, the zinc across the, the mansard and do it in a sort of contemporary classicism uh, as shown in those renderings. Next slide. Um, the rear of the building, let's just quickly touch on that for you. So two maps that illustrate um, the conditions in 1907 and 1955. You can see in the 1907 map, there's a sort of uniformity to the treatment of 103 through 113. They all have these two and three story extensions off the back by 1955. Uh, you can see that 103 at the corner had been reconstructed and that building runs full on its lot. And the extension off of 107, uh, sorry, off of 105 East 64th Street had been demolished. And so turning to the existing photograph on the left, there's an extension on the neighboring building, which you can see in the map at 107 East 64th Street. The uh, extension had been demolished off the back of, uh, of 105. Um, and then directly to the right on the sort of right margin of the photograph is the long sort of sheer brick wall of the corner building. Um, so a few different conditions occurring uh, at the back of the building. Um, and Jason, do you want to continue from here on the proposed facade? Yeah. Um, so the back uh, facade uh, on the left is, is the existing um, facade uh, we just saw an image of moments ago. Um, obviously with the extension into the yard um, of the three foot five and three quarters, um, we're going to remove this facade and, um, and put up a new brick facade in its place in the new location. Um, simply on, on this facade, and I'll get into the massing in, in a second, um, but in terms of materials, we have a similar um, window in the back, but we're not using um, divided lights. This is just going to be a, you know, a steel window system um, at the back. Um, many of these windows are also um, 
French door types um, on, on levels uh, three, four, and five. You can see those, those, those swing in um, and they have a, a glass balustrade. Um, all the windows on the back facade, we've proposed um, an enframement in limestone. Um, as I mentioned, the, the predominant material back here is, is, is brick. It's, it's, it's um, uh, a hand molded uh, a brick. Uh, it's very uh, thin in proportion. Um, but the window and framements themselves will be limestone. Um, this is a way of referencing the front um, and, and what we're doing there. But we decided to wrap the windows um, on all four sides with a, a limestone um, four inch enframement that uh, sits uh, against the brick. Uh, so it's a nice sort of interruption um, in, in an otherwise brick facade. That's, that's also taken down into this lower uh, double story uh, expression at levels one and two and um, carried across in the uh, spandrel um, between those two floors. Um, the entire back sits on a, on a limestone uh, plinth. Um, this is basically uh, to deal with the grade change. Uh, while we were down two feet at the front um, in, in, the, in the rear yard, we can't change that elevation uh, either. So that's uh, where you noted in the section that we project out. Um, basically from that first story, you uh, go down a series of steps to the yard level. Um, so um, that's the base one through four. Uh, the fifth floor is set back and um, in line with the adjacent building at uh, 107 to our east. Um, this creates a terrace um, and that has a glass uh, balustrade around it. Uh, above that um, is our rooftop addition. Um, this is set back, as I mentioned, uh, 14 feet uh, uh, from the face of the fifth floor. And this also has a glass balustrade around it. Um, we carried the zinc from the front. Again, this parity between front and back, um, bringing in some of the, the materials that were familiar. Um, and we put zinc on this, this portion of the addition at the back. Um, it has a large punched opening. And then uh, there is access up, up to the roof level for FDNY. <clears throat> um, this probably gives you a better sense of the massing and the stepping that occurs. Again, this. This projection is uh, three foot five and three quarters at this uh, stories one through four. Um, then that's that sits back and comes in plane with our, our adjacent building. Um, and then beyond that is the setback at the sixth floor uh, addition. What you're seeing over here is um, we're screening in the mechanicals um, on, on this top left portion uh, of that, that large setback terrace. Again, we wanted to bring the mechanicals down from the roof so that, that wouldn't be an element that would be at all visible from the street. Um, you're also seeing some chimney extensions, which are required based on their proximity to, to the roof line. Um, and I th next is a rendering of the back. Um, this view is actually um, a pull back into the neighboring uh, property. So it's, it's taken not from our yard, this would be back another 20 or, or so feet, but we thought you wouldn't see much if, if we didn't pull back all the way. So we, we pulled it back so you could actually see the massing of, of the building stepping back. Otherwise, I think we would just be looking at four stories if, if we stood within our yard. But uh, just to give you a sense of, of the materials and, and the massing, um, we pulled it back. You could see it on this little key map up here with the red triangle. Um, again, you know, we've got this four story base the fifth story set back, and then the sixth story a set back beyond that. Um, you can see an image here, a closer image of the uh, hand molded brick uh, that we're proposing at the back. Um, and then you can see we, we've blown up some details of the enframements around the windows um, at the uh, typical stories where we wrap around all four sides. Uh, we've got this pair of French doors, and then we have a, a glass balustrade between them. And then also you can see a detail of that double height, just, just a corner to give you a sense of, of the brickwork and how that um, resolves itself with the limestone uh, enframement and the limestone spandrel. Thanks, Jason. So just to, to, we're, we're almost done here with the presentation. We wanted to share a couple of views uh, of the backs of buildings. These are 
projects over the past 10 years that have been reviewed by uh, CB8 and the Landmarks Commissioners. The Commission has sort of looked at the rear elevations in a, in a different way, particularly for these mid-block properties where they're not visible uh, from the surrounding streets and sort of approved a range of different types, you know, some that are, are very transparent with a lot of glass, like 3097th and 60th, 78th Street, but also one sort of more akin to what we're proposing, which are really sort of more punched openings, either in a three bay or a two bay wide expression, sort of more punched openings within a masonry field. And that's really sort of, more akin to what we're proposing with the, the uh, Peterson brick and the limestone and frame and sort of set uh, with the with the windows uh, in, in into that into that field of masonry. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so we have uh, we've constructed a mock-up just to sort of illustrate what the visibility of the, the mansard level will be. Um, these are views. This is from the northwest corner of 64th Street and Park Avenue. Um, and what you can see on the left, um, there's the, there's the uh, iron fence and then the mock-up beyond that. Uh, and then this sort of array of uh, ducts and vents and things like that, many of which are actually coming up from the building in the foreground. So you can see just a simple uh, brick side elevation for, uh, for that man mansard top floor. And on the, on the right, you can see the, the, the angled slope of the mansard with the, uh, with the limestone coping. Uh, next slide. Um, turning a little bit to the south, again, you're seeing sort of a similar, you're seeing the brick side elevation of, uh, of that top floor. Uh, we've rendered the mansard, you can see the brownstone below, but on the right, you can see the mansard sort of integrated into, uh, into that blockscape. I think the sort of unusual uh, gabled end of 103 East 64th Street pairs nicely with that mansard roof of 105. It sort of speaks to the variety that one sees uh, in the roofscape. Uh, and then I think the next slides are just photographs basically of the mock-up. So um, that last view is from the southeast, southwest corner of 64th and, um, uh, and Park. Here's a view sort of on the left, uh, looking north from the, from the southeast corner. The view on the right is uh, down the block. You're about halfway between Park and Madison, uh, where you're basically just seeing the top of the building, uh, but not the building or the, the road that much uh, itself. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, and then a few additional views. These are long views from uh, from the north, so from near 65th Street. Um, looking back, where you're seeing um, the the upper portions of uh, of the mansard floor, uh, sort of with a context of of what's uh, what's immediately around it. Next slide. Uh, and then just a few other views. Views from the street. Um, there are some very healthy street trees, particularly on 64th Street, which right now mask a lot of the visibility, but again, you'll see uh, from the east, you'll see the sidewall of the mansard, uh, again, articulated with the limestone coping and the brick side elevation. Uh, you'll see that in the fall and winter months, uh, but not, not as much uh, in, these, uh, in these summer months when the trees are leafed out. Next slide. Um, and then just finally to finish with the rendering. So the, the goal here is to arrive at a design for a limestone fronted building with a sort of contemporary classicism and its detailing materials are appropriate for the district and the organization and composition of the facade, uh, materiality and scale we think is in keeping with buildings of, uh, of, their, of this type, the row house type seen really throughout the Upper East Side Historic District. And with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much. Um, certainly enjoyed you. listening to your presentation. Is there anyone from the public who wants to address the application? We have Sarah Lynch. Sarah, confirm unmuting. Sarah, could you give your address, please? So we, could you? Um... My address is 85 East End Avenue. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, so first of all, the facade is quite an improvement. I have two questions for you. The parlor area, is, th is that uh, metal framework, is that a balcony or is that just metal framework? Is it gonna open onto a balcony? No, that's not a functional balcony. That, that's okay. uh, the decorative element that, that we brought up. Uh, uh, okay. <clears throat> that was just that question. And then my, the, the, the view from Park Avenue, the um, mansard roof that you're adding, I am a little concerned about that, uh, that view, uh, obstructing that view. I, that's, that's my only, everything else looks great, but that, that's my only call out. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. Is that the only member of the public, Saida? Yes. Okay. So I guess we can start now in the um, with Elizabeth. In the okay, Elizabeth, confirm my meeting. Yes. Uh, first of all, how tall is this building at the top? Uh, it's it's seventy uh, feet, uh, six inches, including the the parapet from grade. <clears throat> The, the, 70 the feet to the top of the mansard? Yes, to the top of the, the yes, to the top of the mansard. Yes. The, the existing for reference was uh, 60 foot five inches. So, uh, okay. a 10 foot two delta between the two. Excuse me? Uh, it's a 10 foot two difference between the two. <clears throat> uh, I, I think that this is an extremely handsome building. I think it's a building that fits well into the historic district, well into our um, uh, side streets, uh, and um, I have one problem. I think it's too tall, and I think you may have to go and get yourself a variance if we want to get at this because uh, it's less than 45 feet wide, obviously. Uh, and so its height limit is the width of the street, which is 60 feet or the lower of the fully abutting buildings. And it's not, it's taller. So I, I, I think I could live with it, but I think you're going to have to investigate whether you need a variance because you don't comply with the sliver law. Thank uh, you. We, um, just to respond to that uh, briefly, we, we've been through a, a zoning review, uh, Department of Buildings. Um, they're aware of the height we're proposing. Um, in, in this special district, that doesn't necessarily apply. Um, but I am aware of the slip, slip law, but in this case, on, the, on this particular lot, uh, it's not applicable. Um, well, the sliver law applies in the special district, the special park improvement district. Sliver law applies up here. Uh, so I can assure you that uh, it, it doesn't get out of it by being in the Park Avenue, uh, the special park improvement district. Uh, so I... Um, we, went, we went through a zoning review with the commissioner. We understand this is a special district and there's a specific regulation as res zoning resolution for buildings within 100 feet of Park Avenue. The sliver law does not apply. And this has gone through a, uh, a review with commissioner several times and they have granted that our building can go 110 feet high based on the zoning uh, permit. Uh, uh, zoning resolution, so we are way below what's permitted. So uh, that has been resolved previously with the commissioner and also with this uh, new submission. So they have not raised an objection. And we also have a zoning resolution uh, clarification from the department of building already. Well, I question it. But anyway, I think you've done a handsome job. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, and uh, I think it's perfectly appropriate to the district. So, Gail? I want to commend you for an excellent presentation with a lot of detail. And I understand your contemporary classism. But what I am curious about is if at any point you thought in terms of wood versus metal as you were moving forward? Um, Not that I dislike the metal necessarily, but I was just curious about that. Is this in reference to, to the fenestrate? The windows. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was something that we had explored, but um, given the, the, the client's brief, and in the, the sort of the long-term um, maintenance aspects of, of the wood, uh, we we lent, uh, leaned a bit towards the metal in the in the end. It, it will be a, a steel um, a window system, um, thermally broken, um, but we can get a, a coating on it that will actually uh, 
you know, uh, require a bit less maintenance than if it was a, a painted wood expression. But that, that was something we had explored at, at some point in the process. <clears throat> I just think it might be a teensy bit more handsome if you had moved forward with the wood. And I do understand the, the maintenance. However, usually wood min windows can be maintained and they just look more handsome and as far as my opinion goes, but thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Michelle? Yeah. Um, can you describe again the the um, uh, the roof? You said it was fabricated um, metal. It's a uh, it's zinc. Um, so the, the the cornice, the cornice. I mean. Oh oh, the the cornice Sorry. beneath the mansard, the the cornice. Yeah. Um, yes, that's a a sheet metal cornice. Um, which is um, accepted by LPC. Um, uh, many period buildings um, had sheet metal. Um, there, there are also cornices made out of wood, obviously, but sheet metal was also um, something uh, that was utilized um, in the historic uh, buildings. Um, so all, all the materials are, are, are referencing the, you know, in a historic um, materiality and methodology, um, it, it's just, you know, the details are, are slightly updated um, on, on how these things are erected. Um, yeah, well, uh, I have, it's an improvement from the original building, which had no style. So uh, to me, this is a little, this is overdone. I mean, I think it has too much detail. I think it refers to too many things. Um, and, it, and the front facade is a complete antithesis to the rear facade, which is, very contemporary with a lot of glazing. And um, I have to have, you know, sort of struggle a little bit with it being an improvement from what it was uh, to being what it should be. I think it has way too many elements in the front facade. I think it's very busy and overdone, but I'll have to think about what my vote will actually be. But thanks, Thank appreciate you. the presentation. Thank you, Michelle. Alita. Thank you. Thank you for your very thorough and detailed presentation. Um, I think it's a handsome building, but for me, it's too tall. You didn't so much add a roof addition as you added an extra story, which towers somewhat over the adjoining building. So I'm not sure how I'm going to vote, but I think it's just for me right now, it's too tall, but I'll have to consider and listen to what my colleagues say. Thank you. Sorry for the background. Thank you, Alita. Marco? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to say that this is from the classic architecture, elegant, exuberant, charming, to the real modern facade, excessive glass, and uh, more contemporary. It is a big contrast. Uh, I would like, before I continue, I would like to see if you put it the, the drawings L15, L15, please. Well, as you can see it, uh, uh, I'm seriously concerned. I think, let me start with saying that. There, I, in the past, there are many changes, and you have been shown it to us, and you have proven that it has been a lot of changes in, in the past until was created the Landmark Preservation and Commission. And the idea was is basically to have a public review to see exactly to preserve the historical value of these uh, districts. In this case, yes, it is a North style building. But that, that, uh, that explains it to us that not all people with wealthy money, because at that time, it's just only the wealthy can afford to buy in that section. Uh, they have maybe good taste, may have no enough money, may have something else in that part that dramatically you are changing that this, the street escape. And that is what I'm, I'm trying to see it from the, the drawings 
uh, drawing uh, L15 that basically explained that you are changing now this streetscape. And that made me a little bit concerned. I think because he tried to make a case because in the other project that he presented was, that was exactly my concern. Uh, it is beautiful. I cannot say that it's wrong. Um, it's very well proportioned. You know the, 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 the classic architecture, definitely. You, I absolutely agree. But did you see the great contrast that, that you created in the street escape, even the, the level of the floor are changing dramatically and become a unique within the context of the street escape. Uh, you see the corner, you see the building that you propose and the other buildings. So that is my major concern in this proposal. And thank you for your uh, work and thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, may, may I just speak to that just briefly? I, I mean, I think, you know, what we've, what we've tried to do in this presentation is to sort of illustrate how um, appropriateness is, you know, it's a very elastic word. And I think, you know, in a historic district, um, there's a lot of variability um, as to what, can, what, what you all, what the commissioners can find as appropriate. And I think the one thing, the way we've approached this, and the way we approach many of our projects in, in our office is, um, you know, looking at the character of a historic district. And I think one thing that is very apparent in the side streets of the Upper East Side Historic District is this variety. And what's, what's interesting is that this was a variety that crept into the district 15, 20 years after these early brownstone fronted houses were constructed. And we've included some references, some, you know, historic journals um, that speak to that. But that, that is very much a fact, a very, very much of the presence of the district, that variety. Um, and then the commission, you know, in the 40 years, if I'm getting my math right, 41 years of regulating the district, um, has, have also acknowledged that. And they've approved infill buildings where there are no style buildings, and even buildings that have style designation, approving demolition for some building of a different style than what is directly adjacent. Um, I think the building at 103 64th Street is this sort of, you know, a perfect example of how, you know, that building had floors that, you know, historically aligned with its neighbors. But in 1920, it was reconstructed completely and is quite different than its, than its, uh, than its neighbors to, to the east. It's, it's really sort of very much of a fact of, of, the his, of this historic district in particular. So we see ourselves as sort of sitting within that continuum. Because uh, I think Thank you, you. Are very knowledgeable. You, are, you present your case very well and very impressive. But it just Bye. doesn't convince me. Okay. <laughs> I have to that Thank one. You, Marco. And that Thank you. Kimberly? Hi, thank you, Saida. Um, I echo some of the comments around the height of this building. I am appreciative of how detailed this presentation was, and I can support most of the enhancements to the front facade, but I am a bit worried about the height as well as the amount of glass on the back. Um, but I look forward to hearing what both Jane and David have to say. Oh, Kimberly, you're so diplomatic. Thank you. Jane, David. Is Christina still here or did she leave? She left. Okay, thank you. David. I guess it's my turn. Well. Uh, I agree that appropriateness is an elastic word, as we saw uh, on Madison Avenue. Uh, in this particular case, just going down some of the things that people have said, uh, I think the steel windows are absolutely appropriate um, for all the reasons that Jason Allen stated, plus the fact that they're more elegant uh, and uh, you get larger panes of glass within a multi-pane window. Um, <clears throat> the other side of the coin is uh, I do find this building uh, maybe a little bit ambitious as opposed to deferential to the building on Park Avenue, uh, which is a brick building versus this limestone building. Uh, the other problem I have with it is definitely the mansard. Uh, when you look from Park Avenue, uh, there was something really uh, wonderful about that, the continuity of the roof of the Park Avenue building. And yet now you see this mansard 
behind it, which doesn't even go the full length. It gets very jagged or ragged in relation to the Park Avenue building. So I'm not really comfortable with that top floor. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a problem with uh, the modern classicism, if that's what we're gonna call it on the front, uh, and a modern uh, rear. Uh, and we've, we've seen that on many buildings. Uh, we've even approved a Peter Penoyer building that did that. Uh, and uh, I think that that's okay. Front and the back don't have to be the same. Uh, they can actually be of different styles. Uh, there are actually a lot of uh, precedents for that. Um, <clears throat> I am going to give it a last little bit of thought uh, before I decide uh, how I f whether I feel that I can approve it. Uh, for me, it's marginal. I think that it's thoughtfully done, uh, but I do have concerns about its relationship with the Park Avenue building, the relationship in general with the buildings uh, to the east. And uh, I will, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I understand, and we've certainly discussed this in the committee before, uh, you have to look at the totality of it and make a decision about the totality of it, even if you don't agree with all of it. So I'm looking at it from that point of view, you know what my reservations are uh, and I'll see how I'm gonna vote. Well, David, you don't have much time. We're almost ready for the vote. Well, I just wanna hear what my co-chair has to say. <laughs> I don't know what to say. The truth is that Park Avenue building, which I walk by all the time is so beautiful in its narrowness and its classicism. And I sort of know what you mean that the mansard roof really interrupts that roof line, you know, from Park Avenue going east in a very jarring way. I feel that the mansard roof is so important to the front elevation that we either have to vote up the front elevation or vote down the front elevation. I don't think it's fair to separate out the mansard because it's such a part of the new modern classicism or classic modernism. So I, I don't know how, what we should do. Um, does anybody want to propose a resolution? I'm, I, my sense is that the majority of the board is a little disappointed with the overall design or the sense of the committee. Well, I think we should, we should make a resolution one way or the other so we can vote on it. And I, I'm going to make a resolution. I'm going to okay. make a resolution to approve it. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Do you see a raise of hand, Saida? I right. don't. No, no second. Could no, we get no, an, no. Um, So let's make a resolution to disapprove it. Can we get a second? We have gonna a second from Alita and Marco and Michelle. Okay. So um, with trepidation, we're gonna go to a vote. So, Saida, you can call the roll and see what happens. So a yes is a no. This is a disapproval. Okay, just one second while I unmute everyone. And we're gonna go in reverse order again. Um, yeah, we're gonna start with Elizabeth. Oh, um, we're gonna start with Elizabeth? Yeah, just a regular vote. It's just the vote now, not okay. Um, Elizabeth? Yes. Gail? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Alita? Yes. Uh, David? Yes. Jane? Yes. Marco? Yes. Uh, Kimberly? Yes. Okay. Uh, unanimous disapproval. Well, thank you. Um, I do think it was a wonderful presentation and I learned a lot of new architectural language, which I appreciated. I'm, I do think we all agree that that mansard is too much of an intervention and too visible from the public way. 
and that the building at the corner is just so simple and austere. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> I think that I just want to mention, which Will Bright, Bill was nice enough to put in sort of his news wrap up, which I know Salita helps him with, that I hope everyone does watch my interview for the communications committee. Um, it was a really interesting experience and I was very impressed. I really haven't watched many of the interviews, but now I'm going to go back and watch all of them with the different chairs because I was very, very impressed with the way Will Sanchez and Monica put together the interview with me and threw in a lot of pictures. And some of you will recognize yourselves if you watch it, because I mentioned quite a few of you, not everyone, unfortunately, but I did mention some of you. So any, anything else that somebody wants to mention tonight? Uh, we have a raised hand from Michelle. Michelle can from the meeting. Yes, thank you. It was an issue. I just want to raise an issue under new business that I actually dealt with during the month. There were two items that were scheduled that had to do with Central Park. And one was scheduled in street life and one was scheduled in, um, in parks. And I wrote to all of the co-chairs of, of all of the committees. I'm not sure if I wrote to street life saying that when an item comes up that is relevant to Central Park, usually, or at least in the past, the Landmarks Committee was always invited to, that would be a joint item with Landmarks. And it was explained to me that that was all true in the past, but somehow along the line, the Parks Committee stopped doing that and that it would be um, resumed again in the future. So I just wanted that on the record. I'm assuming that the co-chairs and the rest of this committee would like to be involved when Central Park uh, is, is discussed if it's relevant to anything else. So I went to that meeting of the Parks Department and I asked the preservation questions as opposed to, you know, the ones that are just relevant to their use and and, um, and everything else. And there were changes made. There's an old stone building and there's gonna be some new windows punched in. And so, you know, I, I wished it could have been a little more pure, but I think in terms of what uh, they needed to do in order to make the building functioning, functional, um, it, was, it was a good thing. But I think it'll be nice in the future if we are included in any of those from any of the committees. And um, I just want you to know that I put that out there. And so I'm looking forward to that being the case in the future. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you for going to the meeting. Thank you. Marco, you have your hand raised. Thank you, Jane. Uh, um, I was in the street life uh, meeting and uh, I support this application because they said that they might end the same number of people, 5,500 people. There are no change. The only thing they mentioned that there is an increase of three bars. That is, that is the only thing they mentioned. But in that committee, it was almost impossible to ask where are they? And it was, uh, I couldn't ask this question because it was an equal license completely. But Michelle, she's absolutely absolute right. We had to combine, especially for the Central Park, uh, uh, to find out exactly what are they doing. And, but in this case, apparently they said they, I, they came to renew all the, the license with an increase of three bars, but I have no idea. And thank you. Thank you, Marco. Anyone else want to comment? Is there a move to adjourn? So move. No, oh, thank you, Marco. Well, th thank you everyone. And it was a very interesting evening. I think the three applications were all very interesting for all of us. And I do think that it's that combination of seeing a way forward for progress and trying to preserve the beauty of our streetscapes. So we'll see you at the full board meeting on Wednesday. Okay, have a good night. See you then, have a good night.
Well, Lita, I hope you look at the interview. You got a lot of prime time in my interview, including a picture. I know you can't talk. Did you? I hope you've looked at it, though. We'll look at it. I'm going to leave now and go to bed.